This week on Arts Insight, the universe and the cinematic craft. One of the things we had a challenge was finding 4K resolution footage to use and we couldn't photography. Captivating outdoor sculptures. You know, in, the, in museums, you're not supposed to touch the art. But we want people to have a, like a visceral, physical experience and engage with their world. A painter with a playful style. Once you get that feeling where something is so fun and you're addicted to it, then it's just dangerous. <laughs> and how to create stunning action shots. Making beautiful pictures is just a matter of, of time. I'm Ernie Manus, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. We're downtown at Sundance Cinemas. And if you're a movie lover, like I am, you're already counting down the days until the Houston Cinema Arts Festival. Stick around, we'll give you the details on what you need to know about this year's event, some of which will be happening right here. But first, you might want to keep an eye out for a pretty cool competition that the festival holds called Cinespace. Filmmakers from across the globe create original short films using footage from NASA. Last year, one of the top entries was directed by a creative mind from Space City itself. There is no real life sci-fi better than NASA. As a kid, I loved science fiction movies, stories, exploration, anything to do with robots and different planets and different worlds I was fascinated with. To be an adult and be able to kind of still dabble in that genre and to develop these kind of what-if concept stories is a lot of fun. M1, you have exactly 10 minutes to final marker. Uh, I got into filmmaking about 10 years ago. Digital filmmaking really was a huge game changer going from film to digital made what I thought you know, years ago was going to be kind of impossible to do much more affordable. So when the Cinespace Film Festival came up, I thought oh, this is a great opportunity to try and do something NASA related. The whole cool thing about this was being able to incorporate this great history of NASA and all this archival imagery they have, whether it's photography or video, into a project and develop a story. It's like being a kid, you know, you get to play with, you get to play like you're in, in space, you know, if we can't go up there, at least it's the next best thing. It's a 12 minute film. The process for the entire project was five months. And so what we did is we started initially with, you know, research and developing a storyline. Today would have been my mother's 50th birthday. So I wanted to create a film that had a international flair to it, an international feel. Uju. Udizium, the actress that plays Anuli in our film. And she is from Nigeria. So I immediately got that connection going. And then we knew that we wanted to do something based on water, water's life, and it was a really nice continuing theme throughout. Even out here so far from Earth, I still carry a piece of home with me. But the post-production was what took a long time. It was about three months of just post-production work. Everything that's happened in my life has led to this moment. Because we're taking this NASA imagery and integrating it into the story. And one of the things we had a challenge was finding 4K resolution footage to use. And we couldn't find a lot of that. So we used a lot of photography. And there are about 50 shots in the film that are visual effect shots based on some type of NASA imagery. Uh, about 30 of those shots are based on photography and 20 are based on video footage. We took space station imagery and then just built our own International Space Station Mars off of that. So we figured it would not be the same space station necessarily. The non-linear editing software is, is just tremendous for doing these films. It's a great way to create big scale looking films for very little money. I didn't think there would be a whole lot of music in this initially. But for this, it was that element that really tied it together. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. The 
there is that sense of wonder and excitement that comes with space exploration. The discovery of water on Mars, that was in our film before that was ever announced, which is kind of neat. And the exploration of Mars by mankind has just been announced this September. I mean, so much research, so much stuff that went into the story, it, it enlightened me more and got me more excited about NASA again. A whole new collection of short films will be in this year's Cinespace competition. Find out more at cinespace16.org. Now, a bunch of those winning films will be shown right here at the Houston Cinema Arts Festival in just about two weeks. And to find out everything about that and what's coming up in the festival, we have interim director of Houston Cinema Arts Society, Mary Lampy. Well, first of all, congratulations, eight years of the festival. Isn't it exciting? Every year just seems to get better. And every, every year is unique. And so, you know, we give our audiences, um, you know, the opportunity to really see, I mean, really innovative new things that you might not, you know, you might not have heard of the artists. But, but also, uh, we uh, focus on, uh, on filmmakers who are icons in their, you know, I mean, in their aspect of in their the film, the film community. Yes, I mean across, you know, across countries, across Texas, and it's just an exciting time. Okay, enough of all of that. That's for us. <laughs> but for the people at home that want to know, what can they see this year? What are the high points? Well, uh, I don't know. I don't know where to stop. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, just start somewhere. Okay. Well, I'll start at the opening night, uh, which is uh, at the um, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, who is one of our primary partners, along with Sundance Cinemas. Uh, and uh, we are opening with a, an incredible documentary called Honky Tonk Heaven. And Honky Tonk Heaven is a documentary about the broken spoke uh, dance hall in Austin. Uh, at uh, the Aurora Picture Show, for example, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, showing uh, films by uh, the uh, choreographer and, uh, and, and filmmaker uh, Celia Wilson Hall at the, at the Museum of African American Culture. An iconic filmmaker, Billy Woodbury, is uh, going to present his narrative film, his first feature film. At, uh, at the Manil Collection, uh, we will have uh, Amy Siegel, who was another really an art star. She uh, has uh, she has a new film. Uh, the, the closing night will be Contemporary Color, produced by David Byrne, no, it's Talking Heads fame. And so that film is a documentary about uh, celebrating contemporary color, which is uh, the you know the flags and everything. <laughs> but it's a, an incredibly fun documentary. It's going to be shown in the downtown district outside, and uh, and then we have we have. Uh, Opportunities to see virtual reality firsthand, and the immersive uh, and the immersive cinema trend, you know, which is like the new thing in, in watching in watching films, and the and immersive cinema, for example, will be uh, at the Museum of Natural Science, Houston Museum of Natural Science, where we're going to have a full dome uh, film uh, presentation of short films, and they'll be able to sit and watch. The, the short films in the dome of the Houston Museum of Natural Science. So fresh ways to see films, lots of films across town, lots of venues participating, yes. and many super We're guests. We're very, you know, exactly. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, how can you go wrong? How can you go wrong? Mary, thank you so much, <laughs> and thank you for the festival. Uh, well, thank you. Get a full breakdown of all the festivities at HoustonCinemaArtsFestival.org. Next up, downtown Reno played host to its second annual Reno Sculpture Festival. The streets were transformed into a gallery full of outdoor art. Public art just adds so much to a community. To me, you go to a town with art, it's fabulous. You go to a town with nothing, it's like, ugh. So Reno Sculpture Fest is really a community-wide collaborative event highlighting the work of the sculptors and artists that live in the Reno area, while featuring a few that don't. We've got at least 45 artists on some level with 20 lead artists. And we want to put this art right in the heart of downtown Reno where it's very accessible for people. So the, the everyday person that might not normally go to a museum, let alone Burning Man, um, or any art gallery can come down to downtown Reno, um, experience kind of kid kid friendly activities, friendly music, accessible music, and dozens of beautiful sculptures. I think with the arts movement that Reno 
obviously embraces. Um, it tends to be a hotbed for people recognizing what we bring to the art scene internationally and nationally. And that's really impressive, certainly with festivals like Burning Man and Sculpture Fest, things like that. People take notice from all over the world, and that's what's exciting. If there wasn't Sculpture Fest, for me, nobody would know about who we are or what's going on. And as an artist, it's a fabulous opportunity to get in the limelight. It also takes Reno to another area with art and music and culture. You know, I always thought I had to go to San Francisco for that, but it's starting to grow in Reno and um, it, it's exciting. It really is. Last year was our inaugural Reno Sculpture Fest. It was amazing the kind of support that the community had from starting with the Regional Alliance for Downtown which would help us present to many of the downtown stakeholders and stakeholders throughout the community. So we were able to play 17 pieces in 2015 and fund the production of nine new pieces. And we paid out almost $40,000 to artists for the production of new work. So we want to put the work right out there so everybody can wrap their head around it and kind of come up with some ideas on what we can do with it as a, as a greater community. Because as we support the artists by funding the production and placement, for their work, they get better. They get better materials. They get better skills. They gain experience. And that's what we want to do. If we want to, as we work to cultivate a meaningful civilization, you know, I think the, the artists and the creators are very valuable because we, we lead the charge. Just a little bit of the idea behind the, the, the type of work that's curated at Reno Sculpture Fest is a lot of things to be temporary, modular, interactive, uh, community-driven works, which kind of just means we want stuff that can be moved easily, that a lot of people work on, that participants can engage in. I want a reaction. I want people to know who I am. And as an artist, we're really struggling to, you know, make a living, and what better way is to, you know, it's, it, for me it's like go big or go home. I want to go over the top. It's folks like Pete that really inspired me to want to put this something like this together, you know. Because I, I feel like I feel like these artists with this kind of talent need to spend time in their studios. They need to focus on producing the work. I am building a enormous octopus, as you can see here. The name of this piece is Octavius. This octopus is twenty-three thousand pounds. The substructure is all uh, rebar and concrete, and we handmade over 100,000 tiles that we glue onto the substructure and grout it. It's basically a very large mosaic art piece. It's 31 foot long, 24 foot wide. It's all solid and it can be climbed on. In museums, you're not supposed to touch the art. But we want people to have like a visceral physical experience and engage with their world. Like Octavius, we're sitting on it right now. And I'd love to eat lunch on this thing. I want to take a photo on the top of it. And that does something to people. I want to see people who make brilliant pieces of work be supported and recognized within the community and the world at large. Honestly, I think we have one of the most vibrant arts communities in the country. I really do. You see a town with these gorgeous art pieces and and what it does, and then people want to clean up their yard or clean up the streets or clean up the parks, you know, and it, it kind of, it, it's a foundation for uh, beautification, you know, where people start to care about stuff. The Sculpture Fest is important to Reno and Northern Nevada in general because it shows people what we have. Not just we as the artists, but the big we, you know, as, a, as an entire community. I think it's important for people to recognize what art does, what culture is, um, and how they can engage with it in a, in a very accepting, open environment that, that works for everybody.
It comes down to skill and resource sharing. So it's social capital and creative capital. So with all of our personal talents, we all have a piece of the puzzle. But if we put all those pieces together, we have a masterpiece. It empowers people and it empowers communities and it creates things that would not otherwise be created by yourself. Find out more by visiting renosculpturefest.com. Now, through vibrant, playful murals, a young painter wants to bring a sense of excitement to otherwise routine days. My name is Boy Kong, and I'm an artist. To be honest, I would see my style as something playful, exaggerated. Many people say it's trippy or something, but I think it's I think it's playful, that's what I would like to say. That's the only word that I would use because in the state of mind when I'm creating something, I'm like having fun, I'm playing, you know, I feel like a kid again. When I started painting, I was like, what's a name that you should go after? Maybe I'll just use the nickname my mother calls me or my grandmother calls me too. And that was the name, boy was something they called me when I was younger. So as I became an artist, I was like, why do you have to be a stranger towards everybody? You could be, everybody could be like family. When it comes to murals and stuff, I wanna paint something, but I wanna make it a detour in somebody's day. And everything gets really boring. The whole world becomes like gray and stuff, I feel. Like people just driving, bushes, billboards, houses, gray houses, gray cars, white cars, red light, green light, yellow light. And then I just want people to drive and then they're like, oh, mural, what is this? Acrylic and spray paint, you could work on top of your mistakes. You could feel like you're painting and then you're like, don't worry, I could cover it up. There's no, there's no rush, it's not a race. But with spray paint, I've been getting into it lately and it's been really fun because you can lay down large pieces without sitting there in the sun, just stroking, like painting with a toothbrush on a wall and you're this there just, just blasting. And then just like, whoa, I got that done pretty quick. And once you get that feeling where something is so fun and you're addicted to it, then it's just dangerous. <laughs> the whole thing, art, having murals up like that, that's all new to me. I'm glad that they're out there. People can enjoy it. You know, they don't have to go visit a museum. They don't have to visit galleries to see art. It's like you drive by and you, you know, it's just something new. Growing up here, it just made it stronger for me because there's not a lot of distraction. I think I was, as I grew up, I was kind of happy. I almost thanked my parents because I was like, thanks for like raising me in Orlando, you know? Like I seen, I seen how rough it is out there. But I really like it. It's really nice for what I have to do. It's really nice when you get to paint. You know, I don't have to worry about parking. There's plenty of parking here. There's good weather. I think everywhere has culture. Culture doesn't have to be cool. <laughs> I learned a lot from travel. I learned, one important thing I learned from travel is how much you like home. How much home was more beautiful than it you thought. And another thing I've learned from travel is, yeah, techniques. You meet friends, you meet people, you get inspired, of course, that's another thing. So when I travel, it's like collecting berries and you get home, you just make a smoothie or something. Everybody has a special talent. And I know everybody could bring something to the table. Me adding art to the walls or doing exhibitions and stuff like that. That's what I have to bring to the table. I know where the finish line is. I just want to do art, do it for a living. Pushing myself, I'm still young, so I push myself a lot. Have friends, have family around, and hang out. And art is just that cherry. You know, it's not the whole ice cream. It's the cherry on top. That's what I hope art. I don't want it to consume me. I just want it just to be that little touch that just makes it better. Most people, I think, they're, they're kind of timid. They're like, I don't want to do a lot of stuff right now. It's in Orlando. I want to move to this place, then I could shine. I'm like, you should shine every day, you know? There's not like a time that you're supposed to be your greatest. Like, you're supposed to be the greatest you every single day. Then what's the point of living when we're going to be okay? And you can find out more by visiting Boy Kong Art. Com. And finally tonight, a photographer travels the globe to Africa, Costa Rica, the Galapagos, taking stunning shots with his camera. 
He says many of his images are pre-visualized, and the challenge is making those images a reality. Making beautiful pictures is just a matter of, of time. The beauty's out there. All you got to do is be out there enough to capture it and be in front of it when it happens. As a little kid, I was out hunting frogs and hunting turtles, and, and then I picked up a camera to start documenting things that I saw. I've been taking pictures for over 30 years. I started off with a Minolta X370, which was a real entry-level camera. I explored the woods and fields around my home and photographed basically anything in nature that wouldn't, wouldn't stop moving. I actually, I was going through my desk the other day and I found an envelope filled with, with uh, my best shots from back in the day, just little three by five prints. And there was a bald eagle in there and, and uh, the white-tailed deer and the green heron and things like that. One of the goals that I'm trying to do is, is to get different behaviors. And one of the things that I love to photograph is action. It's being able to stop and act, stop action, photographing birds in flight and animals running and, and show people something that they couldn't see with their naked eye. Well, my camera actually takes 10 frames per second. When you're photographing birds in flight, it's all about wing position. You want their wings up or you want their wings down. You want them in a pleasing position. So the more frames per second you can, you can take, the better your chances of capturing that peak action. Michigan's really a great place for a photographer to be. Michigan is such a great state because of the diversity of wildlife we have. You go up in the Upper Peninsula and it's, you may as well be in Canada. We have wolves and lynx and bobcat and, and all the different, and the boreal forest species up there. And then you come down here into Southern Lower Peninsula and we have, you know, great white-tailed deer herds and turkey and all the songbirds and it's very, very diversified. I've been photographing in Kensington for probably 20 years. Photographed the Sandhill Crane nest, and there's an osprey nest there that I uh, that I shoot pretty regularly. And then they have a beautiful heron rookery. That's a great opportunity for photography. Taking photographs is a lot like fishing. You know, you're out there working all the time, and you're taking a lot of pictures. But really, what we're doing is we're trying to get those trophies, that wow factor image. When I go out, I'm I'm always open to serendipity. If something, if an opportunity presents itself, I'm gonna I'm gonna make that picture. But generally, I go out with a purpose. Most people are surprised to hear that many of my images are pre-visualized in my head. I think of a picture that I want to make, and then I go out and figure out a way to make that picture. And that's one of the things that I love about nature photography is is solving those puzzles, figuring out how can I get a cardinal on this pine branch, or how can I get a picture of the sandhill crane feeding its young, and that's, that's one of the challenges I really enjoy in nature photography. If I could only photograph one thing, it would probably be birds. I really love photographing birds. There's, I mean, they're so beautiful and they have interesting, you know, courtship behaviors and, and nesting behaviors and, and things like that. There's a lot of things to photograph, but um, then after that, it'd probably be the macro photography. And I do a lot of things with, with high-speed flash, where I use high-speed flash to freeze action. So this is my latest and greatest project. This is something I put together to photograph moths in flight. So what happens is the moths come out of the woods and they fly around this light and as they fly around this light there's two lasers that cross and make an X in front of the, the camera lens here and when they break the beam it takes their picture. One of the drawbacks of macro photography is the depth of field, the zone of sharpness in a picture. So the closer you get, the less depth of field you have, the less sharpness you have. So now with computers, now we're able to do something called focus stacking, where we take a series of images at different focus points and then combine them in the computer and give us unlimited depth of field. I travel a lot, so, so when you, you go to Africa, every time you get in a safari vehicle, you're, you're, it's a brand new day and around every corner you just never know what you're going to see. You could see a cheetah chasing a gazelle or, or two lions having a fight or a, a great giant bull elephant walking across the Ngorogor crater. So you get, you got to be open to those possibilities when they present themselves. I go to Africa every year. I've been to Costa Rica probably almost a dozen times, uh, the Galapagos, Ecuador, Peru, Belize. Uh, all over North North America. It's, it's the experience of a lifetime. It's, it's absolutely epic. A lot of my favorite pictures actually probably aren't my best pictures because when I look at my pictures, I've got all the memories of what was going on when I made that image. 
I spend enough time around animals that I, I can weed the signs when they're getting nervous. But I will tell you, one time I was out in Yellowstone and there was a bull moose and he was walking through the river and he stopped behind this hill and I wanted him to take one more step. So I gave him my, which is female moose for, hey, big boy. And this guy came running and I was with a 600 millimeter lens. I was way far away and he come running right at me. I started off shooting film. So I sh actually shoot digital a lot like I shot film. I don't do a lot of Photoshop and things like that to my images. I shoot a format called digital raw. And what that means is it's an unprocessed image in the, in the camera, out of the camera. So I have to color correct it and sharpen it. And that's about all I do to my images. It's important for me to be true to, to nature and to the, the image because I want to preserve it the way it is. And I don't think I need to do anything beyond what I see through the camera usually. You never know what people are going to take away from your work. I would hope that people would, would take away a love and appreciation for nature and, and in a perfect world and want to help preserve it and protect it. You can find out more by visiting stevegettle.com. From Sundance Cinemas, that does it for this edition of Arts Insight. For all of us here at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manus. Thanks for watching and see you at the movies.